Fall of the House of Usher had some memorable moments, incredible characters. The thing that I haven't been able to shake since watching it for the first time is just how insane and gory those deaths were in the show. Which happens to be the topic of today's video, which is me detailing all the deaths of the Usher family from portions of my individual breakdowns of each episode and how they connected to the classic stories of Edgar Allan Poe. So make sure to comment below your favorite or least favorite death, which one of the deaths affected you the most and which one made you feel bad for the actual characters, as well as any deeper meanings you all took away from the story. And of course, if you're looking for more breakdowns of the show, look no further than in the description of this very video in which I have breakdowns of each episode. With that being said, full spoilers ahead their mother dies. Their mother refused for them to get anyone involved in this matter as the kids are left to burying her in the backyard alone. Definitely makes you feel a level of sympathy for the kids at this young age as they were tasked to do this without any help. But on a stormy night, they find their mother is missing from her grave as footsteps lead to their home. As they believe they might have made a mistake by burying their mother who might have still been alive as she arrives in the shadows of the dark and grabs and chokes her son against the wall as he apologizes. As she appears to clearly be dead, but we never learned this episode how and why she was able to rise from the dead, but one would imagine it fits into a very similar theme in Edgar Allan Poe's stories, which is revenge. As she eventually releases her son and she heads directly over to Longfellow's house, she ends up killing him in front of his wife. We learn that Perry's real reason for inviting her wasn't to help her sexual awakening, but he wanted to record her cheating on Frederick and using this as some form of maybe future blackmail or a way to get over on him if he ever needed to because these brothers truly hate each other. As the woman from earlier in the episode standing on top of the building has arrived, dressed in all red and wearing a skull mask, it's revealed to be Verna. She heard Lord Perry into one of the sex rooms, initially tried to stop him and warns him about the consequences of him hosting this party. There was still time for Perry to stop what was about to happen, but his cravings of sex and drugs and debauchery wins and he ignores this warning. As we see, Verna possesses the security guards and others to leave, and she tries to do the same for Morelli, as I believe she chose those particular people because they weren't partaking in the actual situation, or maybe they had pure souls. As the security guards and some of the other people she warned leaves, but unfortunately, we see that she stays. Assume that her true intentions overpowered Verna's possession or her warning. Now, we don't actually see her actual body in this sea of death, but it's assumed that she died. Which, speaking of death, we see Perry signals to turn on the water to fulfill his fantasy. Now, this was supposed to be water coming from these sprinklers, but instead, now trapped and locked inside, the chemical hits their skin and burns them all and melts everyone in attendance on the floor. This was easily one of the most brutal scenes that we've seen so far in this show, as they're all stuck together, as I mentioned, very similar to when we first met Perry waking up to that body of people in his bed. It looks like they're clay together. This was incredibly disturbing, especially the sound design and effects were just perfect in this scene. As Verna kisses the once beautiful boy, in my eyes, this was the kiss of death. Wow, what an ending with that overshot of the dead bodies with their skin all melted off. Now, getting back to the significance of the title of this episode, the title being The Mask of the Red Death. Now, this was a short story by Edgar Allan Poe, and the story followed a Prince Prospero who attempts to avoid the dangerous plague known as the Red Death by hiding inside his abbey. Now him, along with many other wealthy nobles, host a masquerade ball in seven rooms of the abbey, each designed with a different color. Now in the midst of their festivities, a mysterious figure disguised as a red death victim enters and makes his way through each room. At the end of the story, Prospero dies after confronting this stranger, who costume proves to contain nothing tangible inside, and the guest died as well, which is obviously a very important connection to what we saw at the end of this episode. As we see Camille arrive to a secure location, and she isn't let in by this new security guard, who yet again is played by Verna. Just like she did with Perry, she tries to warn her that she can go about doing this another way, but Camille doesn't listen. As Camille starts to take photos of all these poorly treated monkeys, we see one of the cages opens up. Verna walks in, the first thing she asks is, why does she hate Vic so much as she goes into the long documented cruel history of experiments on animals? Now Camille at this point is pissed off and she threatens to kill the security guard until Verna jumps on the table like a wild animal and begins to start to move like one as well. Verna slowly opens her shirt, we see that she has the marks on her chest and she begins yelling and it's at this point that you realize that she's actually swapped bodies with the monkey. 
Verna as his monkey tells Camille that she was supposed to go out in a more peaceful and quieter manner in her bed, but she didn't listen. And hey, it's not personal as Camille just says, screw it. She ultimately takes the picture of this monkey, but unfortunately, she gets her face beat in to death by this monkey. As we cut to the next morning, the employees walk in to find Camille's face and body has been mauled by this Caesar from Planet of the Apes. What an incredible ending. Now, to make the connection to the title of this episode to Edgar Allan Poe's work, besides the detective angle, this short story, interestingly enough, was the first appearance by the character Dupin. As many saw this as the first big detective before Sherlock Holmes was even famous, as his story followed him in Paris as he attempts to solve the mystery of the brutal murder of two women, which connects to the Camille character trying to find out what her sister was up to with the experiments of these monkeys. We end the episode with Jules finally arriving home and seeing most of the walls have been torn down in the apartment, and the apartment is basically destroyed, as is Leo's sanity, as he finally sees, well, the cat never existed, as it appears out of nowhere on the balcony edge as Leo run towards it he falls off the balcony and lands face first on the concrete and he's dead now we know in the next episode next in line to die is Vic now this episode the black cat was based on an Edgar Allan Poe story and it basically followed the story of an unnamed character who had a strong affection for pets but eventually it turned to him abusing them as his favorite black cat bites him one night and the narrator decides to punish the cat by pulling one of his eyes out and eventually hanging it on a tree now this led to his house inevitably burning down but on one of the walls there was this burned outline of that same cat hanging from a noose now later the character replaces the cat with another cat that looked very similar to his but soon he develops a hatred for this cat now long story short this particular character end up getting the new cat tried to kill his cat but end up killing his wife instead he end up finding the cat and also his wife behind a wall with led to the police arrest of him so you can see that there are some nods and some similarities in this episode as has the other episodes have been but the thing that kind of was off with me in this episode was the central theme of the character being compared to leo didn't work for me confirms he does as we see in the background al returns but then we cut back to that night and when they got into that fight and we see what actually happened that night. First saw the scene, we saw that Vic threw something at the door, but they didn't finish the scene. Well, we see that she threw that object at her girlfriend. And as we see the title being playing out, she blames this out of number one, her anger, but also because she felt as though that Al was going to tell on her, hence the tell to her hearts. She kills her girlfriend and she doesn't even consider calling 911. As we finally get the reveal of what that actual noise was, we see what Vic did with her body as she cut her chest open and she put that device on her heart and that's where the noise was coming from, she blocked it out. Vic has completely lost her mind. This shows that he has broken his kids, but also that their mental state is unstable. This shows that some of these kids and Vic being one of them has not only lost their heart, but they also lost what it means to be a human. As we see Vic pull a knife on her dad, but ultimately she claims that they need a better heart. She stabs herself and she dies. So we now know that Tam is next in line to die, but let's talk about the significance of this title, which was based on The Telltale Heart, which is a short story by Edgar Allan Poe, which followed an unnamed narrator who endeavors to convince the reader of the narrator's sanity while simultaneously describing a murder that the narrator committed. Victim was an old man with a filmy pale blue eye or as it's called the vulture eye as the narrator says. The narrator emphasizes the careful calculation of the murder, attempting the perfect crime, complete with dismantling the body in a bathtub and holding it under the floorboards. Ultimately, the narrator's actions result in them hearing a thumping sound, which the narrator interprets as the dead man's beating heart. As we end the episode with Tam, who's now at home, and she just knows that she's lost everything that she's built over the years, as Candy, who's just taunting her about Bill, as she breaks all the glasses around the house, the glass is bouncing in her face, she's stepping on glass. Meanwhile, Candy is not letting loose. She even says that at one point, Tam ate her twin baby in the wound, and maybe this is the part of her brain that's taken over. Over, I mean, she is really in Tam's head. As we watch Candy just continue to torment her, which leads to Tam admitting that she messed up, putting a focus on the word up. 
as we see that she sees Candy above her on the glass mirror and she hits it which causes the glass from above and below her and it impales her in the front and the back killing Tam. This was based on an Edgar Allan Poe story which the plot focused on a character by the name of William who became fixated on this unusual gold colored bug as he discovered it and it led to him going insane. Now a lot of the story included codes which were invented by Poe which was used for the first time in one of his stories. Now one would say that code or hidden code in Tam's story connects to this bug which if you look up bug and you look up a code whenever you have a bug in your code by definition bug has many different definitions but by one definition a bug stands for imperfections and we can tie that to Tam and her imperfections her insecurities her flaws in her relationship and her company's brand which led to her losing her mind which ultimately led to her death construction workers ready to destroy this building now before they tear down the building Freddie wants to go inside which I believe he was hoping to find the missing wedding ring from his wife he pees on the floor as a goodbye to his other Harry and all of a sudden he passes out. His footsteps approach closer to him. It's revealed to be Verna. As we learn, she is interfering with his death by putting deadly nightshade into his drugs. And the reason she did this was after he cruelly pulled his wife's teeth out. Cut to a scene of her possessing him doing this as his wife watches her do so. Very similar to what she did at the club. Verna tells him he earned this and impersonates his voice to tear down the building. She tells him that Rod would have been a poet in another life and Freddie would have been a good dentist as he watches the wrecking ball move move outside just like the clock at the beginning of this episode but also just like the clock Dupin heard a very great callback. She sits next to him as everything slowly starts falling down. We have a pendulum that's swinging right above him. It's almost like a symbol of how he was trying to kill his wife very, very slowly. As Verna says to him that his death wasn't meant to be this cruel, but after what he did, this was meant to be. As it gets closer and closer, she tells him that yes, your dad was wrong, but that's no excuse as he slowly gets split in half. If you all remember, this was the vision that Roderick saw of his son when he was younger earlier in this episode. Episode, what a perfect callback and a perfect scene executed here. As we see Madeline telling her brother that Freddie has recently died and to remember the deal they made all those years ago and there's only one way out. He needs to be the hero as she hands her brother the drugs and this is the only way. As she pours the drugs in his hand, he takes the drugs while drinking it and as he's taking it, we see Madeline telling him he's a legend, he's a king, he's saving them all as he dies. We see Madeline hears a noise behind the wall but walks away as a mysterious hand comes to the frame and touches Roderick and wakes him up is no other than Verna who tells him that she won't let him get off that easy. Now the story this episode was based upon follows this main character who's experiencing being tortured. It's said that this story is effective when it's inspiring fear into his readers because it heavily focuses on senses such as sound and emphasizing the reality unlike many of Edgar Allan Poe's stories which are mostly based into supernatural. The story focuses on what horror really is. Not the physical pain of death but the terrible realization that a victim has no choice but to die. Cut to him being tied up and Madeline and Rod cementing him behind the wall. As they they say this is all for the good of the company, they're personally handling the man with all the crimes from the grave robbing to destroying lives themselves. Rufus has done the legwork to put Roderick in line to replace him as CEO and Madeline as COO as they put the final touches on their you are so small wall. We now know who was behind the wall this whole time and who the jester was who was introduced at the end of episode 1. This is the definition to me of a mystery with a perfectly crafted plot payoff as they murdered their first victim and they set their sights on their alibi. To Lenora heading to bed and Verna is there waiting for her to complete the deal as it's the whole bloodline. She tells her that moments like this do not bring her joy. She goes over this future where she tells her a story about how her mom will have a tough road of recovery ahead of her but she will endure it and she will actually inherit money from this whole fallout and she's going to actually do good with it. She'll start a non-for-profit and she names it after Lenore and saves a lot of lives. Ends up saving millions of lives and Lenore did all of this by saving her mother and in return she saved all those lives. As Vera touches her head and Lenore dies. As I was watching this moment, this is one of the moments that I got emotional because the actress as I'll talk about later that plays Lenore played this character with so much love and so much care and it was just such a sad moment. Let me know how you all felt about the death of Lenore. We see the siblings have been given a moment to talk before things in and you'll notice that Rod doesn't sip any of the drink that he poured for them. As the last few weeks he's been 
gathering all their important belongings to be buried like pharaohs. As they discuss what they've accomplished with this company, why she never had kids, how other companies and governments tear people apart every day, the playbook of men and women having children and passing down their traumas as she continues to drink up, it's them versus the world and death will have to look her straight in the eyes as she realizes he's messed with her drink and she passes out. As we see Rob preparing his sister's body like a goddess and a queen and he sets her up for a tomb for the afterlife. But it appears he didn't make sure she actually died just like he did with their mother as we hear her coming up the stairs as we hear his truth. He knew deep down, he knew that he would make it to the top over all the dead bodies and he has no regrets being the last usher standing. As Madeline makes her way up the stairs filled with with rage and hate in her eyes which were replaced by those set fires he got for his sister for her birthday her tongue's now missing but she's still yelling with rage as she chokes her brother to death just like their mother did to their father in episode one a story about a man who lost his love at Belor. A story that represents the grief of losing a loved one and the struggle to overcome it as we saw rod losing his family and struggling to overcome losing what he built the nevermore meaning of not having again or never again the usher family killing and abusing the power never Never again because their bloodline is never more. As Verna the Raven represented an omen of bad luck, also evil and death, she was an ancient being filled with wisdom beyond human understanding. She was intelligent and she also had the ability to adapt and shape shift as she also had the ability to offer corrupt individuals a sense to completely transform themselves, which a lot of them chose to do evil things with and it came at a cost. 